Hey everyone, it's Dino. Uh, today what I'm gonna do is to go through some more questions, uh, questions 11 through 20. Yesterday I did uh, uh, 10 questions, uh, one to 10. So let me just quickly share my uh, PowerPoint and we will uh, get to the questions. So again, like I said yesterday, this is just my own analysis and uh, you can come up with your own answer. So if so, you can just put it on the comment on YouTube uh, you know, this is uh, your uh, choice and you can just put the rationale and this is how we learn, right? So just keep an open mind. That's how I've been. And so I am willing to listen uh, to any uh, suggestions uh, in a different uh, analysis of the answer. Yeah, that's how we learn, right? Okay, so you should be able to see my screen here. Oh boy, this looks like a long-winded uh, question here. Vehicle number one collided with vehicle two. At the scene of the accident, I'm just checking my speaker, everything working here. Yeah, they are all working. At the scene of the accident, it is determined that vehicle number one was completely at fault, but did not have auto insurance. Oh, wow. Okay. So he's causing an accident and he's driving without insurance. So it's really having a bad day. Vehicle number two was insured under OAP1, Ontario Automobile Policy 1. So the owner of the vehicle number one sustained severe bodily injuries. So this, this whole thing is going very badly for vehicle number one. Vehicle number one's owner will obtain payment for medical rehab and attendant care from, okay, I know this is a loaded question. Immediately what comes to mind is, why should anyone pay vehicle number one? Because he caused the accident and he's driving without insurance, okay? So that's what goes in our mind, okay? But let me explain something before we get to the answers. So I wanna give you what exactly the rule in Ontario before we get to the answer. So once you have your little analysis from your own knowledge of reading this somewhere, okay, in your textbook, then when you look at the answer, you can easily find the right answer, okay? So in Ontario, Let's say you meet with an accident. And then um, let me let me uh, rephrase this. Let's say you are um, an occupant in your friend's vehicle. You're just a passenger in your friend's vehicle and you meet, meet with an accident. And you also have your own car and you have your own policy, but you're riding with your friend and you're injured. Even though you're riding with your friend and his fault and car accident happened, you have to go to your own company. That's how it works. Because you have your own policy, you go to your own company. Let's say you don't own a car and you don't have insurance. Then you go to the policy of your friend who is driving the car. So let's say now your friend tells you, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm driving. Actually, I didn't tell you this before, but I'm driving without insurance. <laughs> okay. Now what you do, you look around and you see if there's any other car was involved in the accident. Not that just you flag a car which is passing by. No, 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 no. <laughs> Another car should have been involved in the accident with you, with your friend's car. Then you can actually, all of you who's injured in your friend's car, including you, you can go to that car and ask him, hey, uh, buddy, <laughs> you know, we, we are just driving without insurance and we're all injured. Uh, can we use your policy? And he says, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, I hate to break this news to you. I'm also driving without insurance. So uh, he's also injured. Now, the final stop for all of you who is just driving without insurance, no concern for yourself and the society, okay, and you're all injured, you do have a recourse. The final stop, all of you can get get Uber and you can go to the Highway Indemnity Fund. It's run by the province. I won't get into it uh, at this stage. Maybe another question may deal with it. But this is the trajectory. You go to your own policy if you don't have a car. Involved. So anyway, I don't want to repeat this whole thing. That's how it works. Now, with that in mind, let's just uh, read the last sentence. Vehicle number one's owner will obtain payment for medical rehab from where? We know from the question that vehicle number one doesn't have insurance. 
Okay, so when you go back to the trajectory that I explained a minute ago, then vehicle number one, even though he caused it, I know, I know, he caused the whole mess, but still he's injured. He can ask you, I mean, not you, I mean the vehicle number two, okay? So, hey, you know what? Uh, I know I'm driving without insurance, but can I just, uh, you know, piggyback onto, onto your policy? Yes, that's the rule. So let's see if that's one of the answers here, okay? So no one as vehicle number one has no insurance, so that's not possible. Okay, if nobody has insurance, in my example, you can still go to the provincial government claim fund. But B is also not correct because there is another policy. So this one is only no one has any policy, then you go to the government fund. So C, the insurance policy of vehicle number two. Uh-huh. Okay, so this is the right answer. Okay, that's how uh, the order of filing a claim happens in Ontario. So the owner of the vehicle number one's past expired policy? No. Past expired policy is past. Okay, they're not going to respond. So C is, uh, let me put this here, is the right answer. Okay. I know it's kind of a long-winded, but maybe you want to listen to it again and see my example of, you know, you riding with your friend and everything. Okay, it'll make sense. Insurance companies must make settlement payment to an insured Okay, now they're playing with numbers, the number of days. To answer this question correctly, you need to know. You can't just guess it, okay? Within 60 days of receipt of application, uh, no, that's that's wrong because I do know the date is 30 days, okay? So, I mean, it's been in many questions. So we know it's a 30 days from the time uh, the adjuster receives the, uh, the application uh, for coverage, okay? Not, not coverage, for the, for the claim. Okay, so within 10 weeks, no, that, that's too long. Okay, of receipt of completed application or it's too long, it's wrong. Within a reasonable time, uh, you know, they do have a set time limit. Okay, it's not a reasonable time, could be a few weeks, a few months, a few days. It's very subjective. Okay, <laughs> but no later than one year, uh, no. So within 30 days, yeah, that is the right answer here. Uh, 30 is receiving the application for accident benefits in case of death, funeral, and compensation for other expenses. Okay, so 30 days, the D is the right answer. Moving on to the next question. Mr. Lang owns an auto but has not purchased insurance for it. See, this is a big mistake people are making. I believe in Ontario, one in seven people after COVID, they're driving without insurance. I saw some report recently, one in seven, because they're still out of job, People are hurting and they still have to drive the car. Okay, so it's pretty dangerous. Okay, driving without insurance because in Ontario, the penalty for driving without insurance can range from $5,000 to $50,000. That's a big hit you're going to take. Okay, you might as well go and get insurance. It'll be much cheaper than paying that penalty. And plus, it's going to go on your record. You were caught without driving, driving without insurance. It's going to go on your record forever. Okay, any company can run that record on you. Uh, it's going to have a long-term uh, effect on you, okay, driving without insurance. So, but Mr. Lang is doing that. So he drives the car anyway, and in the process runs over Mrs. Brooks' foot. He's having another bad day here, Mrs. Lang, while she's crossing the street. So her foot is crushed and requires extensive care. She will be unable to work for six months so that means she really needs some help here. She does not drive and is not covered under anyone's auto policy. So here you can see there is no policy in existence. Both of them have no policy. Then who will pay for her bodily injury? Now you can see from my previous explanation of the previous question, you already guessed it. If you follow the trajectory, it'll be the Highway Motor Vehicle Fund. Okay, let's see the um, choices. Her prior insurance, no, forget about it. The prior insurance, they will never touch the claim now. Okay, they, they, it's done. After your policy expired, you didn't renew with them, you can go back to them. The Motor Vehicle Accident Claim Fund, or it's also known as some provinces Highway Victim Indemnity Fund. This is the right answer because there is no other policy that can pay for this, but she needs care. Yes, we do have 
at the setup already. The facility association is wrong because this is, we may discuss in a different uh, question. This is the last stop for the very bad drivers. Those are keep on causing accidents and convictions, okay? So because in many provinces, they follow a rule called take all comers. What that means? Take all comers means, well, for example, I live in Ontario. Here, the take all comers work this way. We cannot, we mean the insurance company, they cannot refuse automobile insurance to a licensed driver, regardless of how bad the driver is. He may have caused many accidents, whatever it is. Regardless, we cannot say no to that person as long as he has a valid driver's license. That's mean take all comers. So what the insurance company did, they created high-risk market and facility association, the last stop. Okay, so the, the, the whole purpose of facility is different. So to cover the high-risk uh, drivers, so insurance is available to everybody according to the provincial mandate. So it's got nothing to do with the, the broken foot, the crushed foot of uh, <laughs> Mrs. Brooke, okay? The insurer of the vehicle that the uninsured driver was driving, that doesn't even make a sense here. The insurer of the vehicle that the uninsured driver was driving, so it already says uninsured, it's an oxymoron, okay? So one time I was driving, my, my daughter lives in California, then we were just going through the Napa Valley one time, driving through, and I saw this board, which I'll, I'll never forget. I used it in one of my PowerPoint, my training. It says, um, Death Valley Medical Center. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So it's a Death Valley, and the, what the medical center is doing there. <laughs> so it's an oxymoron, you see. It's not a good combination. So an insurer of the uninsured driver? No. Okay, so I'm going with the B, okay? Question 14, your client calls and asks you to suspend coverage. I know it's right away, it's OPCF 16. Okay, you need to be familiar with all the OPCFs, okay? Uh, from his vehicle while he's going uh, south for four months uh, in the winter. As a careful broker, you would advise which of the following. I already see OPCF 16 here. So record that his insurance suspend coverage by using the suspension of coverage endorsement 16 and uh, cancel his policy. <laughs> Why would we do that? Okay, no. Have collision coverage and comprehensive coverage deleted from the policy, but leave the rest of the policy intact. No, he's not going to be driving it. You will simply park it and you will suspend the coverage. We don't have to delete any coverage. We don't do that. Advise the client to leave all coverage in place. No, then he's not going to get a discount. So why are we suspending the coverage? Because he wants to get a discount because he's not going to be using the car for four months. Yes, we do this. Okay, we don't remove the coverage. We suspend it. That means the insured cannot drive it and he's going to get a discount. So A is the right answer. Okay. So the daughter of your client calls to report an accident she has had with her father's car. So we are assuming that she's driving the father's car with this consent. So the vehicle is not drivable and she's in the hospital with injuries. Wow. On completing the claims report, you find out, there's a spelling error here, you find out that her father has died a month earlier and no one advised the broker or the insurer. You advise her that, okay, this, I have to say a few words about this. So what they're talking about here is death of the insured has taken place. He passed away and still someone is driving the car. Okay, so in the industry, there are some exception they make. So the insurance company can say, hey, the insured is no longer there. Your father is the insured on the policy and he died. So that means the policy is null and void. No, they cannot say that. So the insurance company, they cannot say that in three situations. One, is, I know I'm just kind of digressing to a different topic, but this is very relevant. Okay, one is death of the insured because it just happens all of a sudden. And then the bankruptcy of the insurer or bankruptcy of a company, if you're doing commercial, okay? And the succession that follows the death of the insured. So in these three situations, 
the insurance company has to give more time to settle everything, especially in this case. Now, the no one called the insurance company. Probably they didn't even think of calling the insurance company. They're dealing with the grieving, the death of the dad and whatever it is, okay? So the it's not in their mind to call the insurance company when the father died. So this is why the government, they make some exceptions for the insurance company and they tell the insurance company to continue the coverage until, uh, because the question doesn't say that the insurance company knew about it. They already called the daughter. They told her that she has to change the card's ownership to her name or somebody's name. Nothing, none of that has happened. Okay, so no one has called. That's what we have to assume. So that means the daughter is still has coverage. The insurance company, they are not allowed to cancel the policy. They should have, they should deal with a case and have the ownership changed, but none of that has happened. So that means the coverage continues. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's see the uh, the options here, okay? The insurer will refuse to pay due to the material change in risk. Yes, there's a material change, the significant change is the, the passing away of the dad, but the insurer cannot refuse because the question doesn't say the insurer knew about it or something and the daughter refused to do something, change the ownership. No, 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 none of that has happened. The insurer cannot refuse. So A is wrong. The insurer will pay only collision and not accident benefits. Why not? Because she's injured. Okay, why not action benefits? So refuse to pay the claim due to non-disclosure. No, because we have to assume that the daughter did this on purpose so that she didn't disclose this. So non-disclosure is, you know, somebody did something deliberately that didn't disclose something. Why wouldn't the doctor call uh, the daughter call the insurance company and say that my my dad passed away? But maybe she didn't know what to do. The family is just grieving the uh, death of the father. Okay, so it's not non-disclosure. And then D, the claim is paid in full. That is correct. So if you just go back to my previous explanation how the government, the regulator, they make three exceptions in the succession because that happens right after death. There's a chaos going on, okay? Uh, and then the bankruptcy, a big mess follows the bankruptcy and the death. So all these things happen. And then the aftermath of that is so murky that the government told the insurance company, don't just cancel the policy right away because we have a special situation. Let the death settle down. And now we know what's going on, okay, with all the bankruptcy and everything. And then you can take your measures of uh, refusing coverage, but not immediately. So in my opinion, the claim should be paid in full in this case, okay? So I'm gonna go with D. Oh, here's the facility association we talked about. So here is the, they want you to know the definition of facility association. So it's a good opportunity to say a few words about it. So, you know, if you get the same question, you know exactly how to answer it, okay? So, a reinsurance pool, which is totally wrong, okay? What's a reinsurance company? The reinsurance companies like Swiss Re, Munich Re, uh, Trans Re, these are like multi-billion dollar companies. They work in the background and they are their clients are insurance companies, okay? So, let's say a frontline insurance company like Aviva, Intact, or Travelers, they have, um, they take risk from the public. They insure homes. What they usually do, they take a portion of what they have accepted from the public and they'll send it to the reinsurance company because they don't want to put like, to use an old cliche, uh, put all the eggs in one basket. Okay, if the basket drop, then they're going to break all the eggs. Okay, so basically what it means is you don't keep all the risk that you took from the public for yourself because the too many claims come some companies have gone bankrupt because they just couldn't manage the claim. So they'll take like 20, 30, 40% of the risk they've accepted from the public and they give it to the reinsurance company and then they share the premium and everything, okay? So the facility association is not that. It's not a reinsurance company, okay? So I won't even read the whole answer here because I know reinsurance is completely wrong. An insurance pool, Subscribed by all auto insurance companies, that is correct. 
who share in the writing of risk that are not ordinarily written on the normal insurance market. I'm very happy with the B because this is a typical definition of facility. So they take in the high risk drivers, which we discussed before a few minutes ago. So these drivers, they're not eligible to get into the ordinary uh, market. We also call regular market for regular premium. So because they, are, they have so many at fault actions on their record, so many tickets and speeding and so on and so forth. So they will be sent to the facility and it is uh, run by the insurance companies and they share the writing of the risk. So at the end of the year, all the insurance company, they have subscribed to the facility association and they share their loss or the profit, okay? Uh, so this is a good definition, but let's take a look at the, the, the two other ones. A group of insurance carriers who write business on auto uh, owned by brokers and their staff? No, no. This is almost like just writing the business just for the, for the brokers and their staff? No, it's wrong, okay? The provincial government insurance office, Let's stop right there. There's nothing called the Provincial Government Insurance Office. No. In Canada, there are three provinces um, back in the West. BC, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. They provide insurance, basic insurance to all the residents. So remember this. Maybe there's another question dealing with that. BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, they provide government insurance for all the residents. But here we are talking about Ontario. Remember Rebo, Registered Insurance Broker of Ontario. So there's no provincial government insurance office which is charged with the responsibility of accepting applications. No way. There's nothing like that. 100% of the insurance in Ontario is provided by private companies. Private company. That's it. Okay. So D is wrong. So I'm going to go with B. So we have four more questions here. Uh, did I? Okay, so the owner's application for auto insurance uh, must be sent to the insurance company uh, within how many days? As far as I know, there's not exactly the number of days they require. There's just an application for auto insurance. Okay, you're not gonna tell your customer, uh, you know, they got a quote for auto insurance and then you're telling them, okay, you have to send me your application within seven days. Otherwise, I'm, I cannot give you a policy. <laughs> you don't say that, okay? So he can send it like a month later or two months later, whenever he wants to purchase auto insurance. You're not going to give him a deadline. Uh, you know, he's going to, are you okay, buddy? <laughs> you give me a deadline. I'm the one to purchase insurance. So leave the decision to me, okay? So what that basically means is you cannot force them and give them the deadline to send the application, okay? And so let's see the uh, the options. Within seven days, no. Within 21 days, we're not going to put a deadline. Before the end of the business week, no. Again, you're giving me a deadline. As soon as possible or practicable, this is correct. It's just an application for an auto insurance. So you just tell them, okay, Mr. Customer, you know, as soon as possible, send, send it to me and we will uh, set up the policy for you. That's all you can do. Okay, I'm just going to go with the D. Your insured gets in touch with you to let you know that a close friend from Nova Scotia who is uh, licensed to drive there in Nova Scotia will be visiting you for about a week. So the insured expect the friend will likely be driving the insured vehicle during the visit. You advise the insured the following. Okay, so before I get to the answers, I'll just tell you if somebody's come from a different province or from the US to Ontario, they can drive. You know, we have people coming into Niagara Falls from New York all the time, okay? So they don't, as soon as they enter the, cross the bridge, uh, you know, into Ontario, they have to go to an office and get a license to drive here. No, they're driving their American license. Same with a different province, okay? They come into Ontario, they can drive. Even if you want to get a job in Ontario or coming from another province like Quebec or something, you get, I think, about three months to get your license in Ontario and to change your thing. You need some time to settle down. So we recognize, okay? So let's, with that in mind, let's look at the options. Add an endorsement to extend coverage to the friend 
Uh, I don't think so. Why? Because it's just going to be here for one week. Okay. You don't need to add an endorsement because he can be, you can, by the way, you can lend your vehicle to anyone. Okay. If you look at my other things that I uploaded to YouTube, if you do a search uh, for lending your vehicle, do a search on my YouTube channel, you will see the legal trouble that you'll get into for lending the vehicle. Just, just a quick aside, okay, if you want to check that. There's a lot of problem lending vehicle. But this guy, uh, you know, the, the friend is going to be driving the car. He's going to be only for a week, and you're going to give him consent to drive the car. You don't have to put him on the endorsement. The visitor cannot drive the vehicle unless they pass a test for Ontario. No. We do recognize from other provinces he can drive the car. Ask the insurer to send you a letter to be passed to the insurer. No, we don't need to get a letter from the insurer. Is you know uh, this person is coming to send you a letter to the uh, to be passed to the insurer. No, we, we don't need a letter. So that leaves us with the D. The policy coverage protects the driver, the visitor, so long as he or she has a valid driver's license in Nova Scotia, and your insured gives consent to the visitor to drive his or her vehicle, okay? That's absolutely correct. So there are two things here that the person coming from Nova Scotia should have a valid license, should not be like in a suspended status, and you should give him consent to drive the car, which we expect that you'll be doing, okay? Is your friend visiting you? So there's no need to make an endorsement, no need to send a letter, nothing. So D is the right one, okay? Two more questions. So the threshold in Ontario policy refers to, what is a, a threshold? So remember this, usually it's usually called a verbal threshold. Okay, but you can say threshold. It's immediately connected to accident benefits. If you want to sue somebody in Ontario for uh, somebody caused you bodily injury in an automobile accident, and you are planning to sue the person the law says that you have to cross a verbal threshold and that usually refers to that you sustain a permanent injury, uh, either it's physical or psychological, okay, some kind of serious or permanent impairment or injury that you sustain, only then you can uh, do a lawsuit against the other person who caused the accident, not for like whiplash, a strain, or sprain, you'll be simply wasting your time and money with the lawyer. Okay, so the government said it has to pass a threshold. Okay, so it's nothing to the dollar amount. So the 1 million liability choice A is talking about the third party liability, which I have a presentation. I think that the first one that I uploaded, okay, if you check that out, I, I explain everything about third party liability. So there's nothing to the threshold. Death, permanent serious disfigurement or permanent serious impairment of an important physical, mental, psychological function. This is verbatim, word for word, what is known as the threshold. This is the right answer. Okay, B. Catastrophic injuries? No, it's not a threshold. So the threshold is a clear definition. To, in order to sue somebody, you have to cross this threshold. Okay, uh, what's mentioned in B. And the D is economic losses. Don't even worry about it. Okay, so economic is referred to monetary losses that, you know, immediate medical expenses the insured incurred uh, is, uh, you know, is closed with damage or, you know, whatever happened during accident and they have to spend some money, the first aid and things like that. Those are called economic losses. No, we're not talking for, to get economic losses, you don't have to uh, cross a threshold. Why have to cross a threshold? In order to sue somebody, uh, it's usually you're talking about like um, uh, big injuries, okay? Uh, permanent serious disfigurement. So then, yeah, you have a right to sue the other party. Okay, so I'm going with B. And finally, after theft of the insured automobile is reported to the police, the insurer will reimburse the necessary transportation expenses in the following manner. What is it talking about? Now, this is talking about rental car, okay? Transport, necessary transportation, so it's rental car because your car was stolen. The theft has happened, and then you reported it to the police, which is the right thing to do. The insurer will reimburse for 
transportation expenses because now you're renting a car. So this is a coverage which is automatically included in all policies. Okay, but there's another coverage called OPCF 20 that you have to purchase separately by paying extra money to the insurance company. And you can pick and choose the amount, 1,200, 1,500, 30,000, whatever it is. We are not talking about this because the question doesn't refer to OPCF 20 here at all. Okay, it's just talking about transportation expenses and it specifically mentioned theft. So there is a coverage, uh, if you're a broker listening to this, some customers will ask you, okay, why do I have to purchase this OPC of 20 and 27? Don't I have some rental car coverage in my policy automatically? And the answer is yes. They do have some rental car coverage without having to purchase OPC of 20, but then it has some conditions. What, what are the conditions? They can only make a claim for the rental car if their car is stolen. If they are in a collision or something else happened and they make a claim, no, that's not going to respond. It has to be the theft of the automobile. The second condition is that they have to wait for 72 hours. With the OPC of 20, you don't have to wait for 72 hours. And also with the OPC of 20, you can make a claim and get, get a rental car for any, any reason. Collision, uh, not just theft lightning, fire, whatever happened to your car, when you made a claim, you will get the rental car with OPC of 20, but not the one which is included automatically. So you can only make it for theft and also 72 wait time and the maximum the company can give you rental car is $900. Okay, so those are the three conditions for the coverage is automatically included if your customer ever asked you. So that's why the industry actually introduced OPC of 20 where the customer doesn't have to wait for 72 hours and they can make a claim for rental car for any loss when they make a claim and they can choose their amount, how much they want. They, they want $5,000 a rental car? Yeah, they can have it. They have to pay extra for it, okay? So that in mind, you can see, I see the 972 hours here, the, the answer right here already, okay? So this is wrong, this is wrong, maximum 300, no, this is wrong. So because, you know, when you're dealing with the numbers, there's nothing else can be the right one because you have the numbers in front of you. So limit 900 after 72 hours, yes, because it's not talking about OPC of 20, then you have to say the right answer is B. So I'm gonna go going with B. Thank you so much, everyone. So if you like this video, if somehow it helped you, so subscribe uh, uh, to my uh, channel so we can make more videos. And I'm gonna be making more videos, more questions, okay? And also, if you have a comment about uh, one of my explanation that you may not agree with it, sure. Let's have a discussion. Uh, you know, everybody can benefit. That's how we learn, okay? I already said in the beginning, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that I'm 100% and know everything and I, you know, everything I say is right. No, okay? It may not be right, okay? Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day.